Well, good afternoon. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, if you came to this presentation in hopes to hear someone kind of soft-spoken and non-animated, um, you're going to be disappointed. I'm a, I'm a passionate speaker about things that I really like, and technology is one of those. Um, I've got almost 30 years in technology, and, and I kind of stumbled into it. Um, uh, not many more than 30 years ago, I, I won a, a lip-sync contest to ring a fire in a building about 300 feet that way. And uh, about that same time, I was poor, broke, uh, and, and trying to get through college and landed a job with a retail store that WordPerfect had called Computer Show. And um, from that point forward, I've been just in, in, engrossed in technology. And the purpose of today's presentation is to um, express to you my understanding of what the Internet of Things is and why it's important to you as an individual, to you as a business person or a student, and to, I would even say to extend it to, to your family or to your children or to their children. Because in my opinion, what's going on now with information technology is substantially greater in magnitude than all other things that have taken place with information technology. Let me start out by giving you a brief uh, history of who I am. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a sales guy by trade, so uh, all things technology have just kind of been picked up. I was fortunate enough out of college to get a job with IBM out of Salt Lake City. And my first job there was to work with the IBM mid-range computer systems, AS400s, RS6000s, what we thought were the best computers ever. And they worked. We sold a ton of them. Um, and we sold them to small businesses, big businesses, and everybody. And uh, I got a call from a, a, a friend at IBM and said, you ought to come work for the IBM PC company. And I thought, hmm, personal computers, this is, this is good, I think it's good. So we, we negotiated a, a transition there, and I went into my boss. And I had hit my quota about halfway through the year, so I was kind of out to pasture, as they say. Um, and I said, you know what, I want to make more money, I want to evolve, I want to do something. And he said, just, just learn how to golf better. Just nurture your customers. That's what you do at IBM when you hit your quota. Just, just love it. I said, no, I need PCs. And he said, you're stupid. He called me stupid. He said, PCs are a joke. They're not necessarily going to penetrate the business market. Well, he was wrong, obviously. And, and shortly thereafter, I joined the PC company. I had great experience. I, uh, one of my memories is delivering the first IBM ThinkPad west of the Mississippi to Tom Wynn. Uh, or sorry, Steve Wynn, the, the founder of Bellagio and, and the, 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 the hotel guru down in uh, Vegas. Um, shortly thereafter, after IBM, I joined a, a classic Utah startup. And I, when I say classic, back then, this company had um, funding from a polygamist family. They had some, some we'll say, some church, heavy church influence. They had, they had West Coast, East Coast. It was just this crazy barrage of, of all things that make Utah business, tech business, as quirky as it gets. I then moved on to the, one of the first two Linux distributions that sprang out of the University of Utah. The other one is called Red Hat, you might have heard of it. Turbo Linux, or as we called it back then, Pacific High Tech, you probably didn't know about it. But it was, it was my introduction into disruptive technology. After that I joined a, a spin-out from the University of Utah, a, a software company. After that, I, I moved to working down in Utah County. Um, the founder of Novell, when he left there, he set up an investment fund called the Canopy Group. And his first investment was a company called Caldera. Many of you may know Caldera. It had quite a, quite a history. And uh, I'm not going to dive into that, their lawsuit against Microsoft and other things. But I was fortunate enough to be involved there. And then we spun that into another technology company called Lineo. And as one of the founders of Lineo, um, I spearheaded our investment. So I got my first taste of venture capital. Uh, we, invest, we got about $75 million of, of venture capital from around the world. We grew from four of us to 480 through eight acquisitions. And we filed our S1 to go public. We, we were doing everything right. Um, and the market crashed. And um, what was left was sold off to Motorola. Uh, what we did there was uh, my first foray into 
what I thought was the Internet of Things. And we did embedded operating systems for smartphones. We were the first player in that space. Um, from there, I moved into MacStream. And what, as was mentioned, MacStream was a company that I co-founded. We ran it very tight. The Canopy Group invested. We sold the company um, uh, uh, for just about 50 million bucks uh, in or 2006 to a publicly traded company. And, and that was a great experience. And MacStream was, was my first trans or first experience into wireless. Uh, MacStream is famous for providing wireless gas and electricity meter technology to the biggest um, uh, uh, utility companies in the world. Um, and that company still, or that, that product line is still doing great. Um, it was based here in, in Linden. Uh, after that, I, I thought that after you sell your company, you're supposed to go do a bunch of fun stuff. So I invested in a uh, fish technology company with some buddies. I invested in a long-range Wi-Fi technology with another buddy. Uh, I looked at over 1,200 business plans as an investor. Um, I was a judge for the Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award competition. So 1,200 different companies that I looked at. And what I hoped to learn from that was, did we get lucky? Or is there some skill involved in being an entrepreneur, especially a technology entrepreneur? And, and I believe it's the latter. I think there's skills that can be developed. From then, I moved to a, a very quirky technology that a that very quirky guy uh, had invented. Um, that as I was leaving, he said, and remember, I know how to make bombs. So I, I, I wasn't there very long. And then finally, I, 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 uh, I started Monet. And um, the net result is some great success, some great recognition, two IPOs, three acquisitions, one license deal, and five of the entities are still going on. But, but the reason I bring this up is I want to be able to express to you what I've seen through this, through this life in technology, and why I think that this time is so paramount uh, um, as an opportunity for you and probably to keep your eyes wide open just on all aspects of it from the business as well as anything else. So Monit is a provider of solutions, monitoring solutions for businesses. That's what we do. Now, it didn't start that way. I'm a wannabe farmer and I have a 95-year-old grandpa who's my best friend. And um, about 2009, he was out feeding his horses, and he fell over, broke his hip. And he, think of John Wayne breaking his hip. He crawled about 150 yards up to the road and waved somebody down. And, and my heart just broke, because I found out my grandpa, just he'd been in so much pain. And here I am, this technology guy that understands how to solve problems. And he didn't have a little paper that he could have just pushed a button, and we would have and over to help him, the two or three hour um, struggle that he had getting to the road. And so I started Monit, literally, with the idea of sensors. Uh, I know a little bit about wireless. Grandpa needs it. Let's, let's jump into it. And, and part of that st stupidity, if you will, of not knowing all of the options out there was, was beneficial. And I think it's going to be beneficial as we evolve the Internet of Things. So um, we started doing that. We started from the ground up. I started hiring engineers. and challenging them uh, to, to look at different things. And so we said, well, my grandpa's out in the field. How are we getting a press button to my cell phone? Well, there's a thing. There's a transport. Maybe that transport goes right to me, or maybe it goes through a hub or a gateway. And then it goes maybe through a carrier, and then to me. And then how do I look at it, or how do I interact with it, or if I'm the only one? Is it just human intervention, or does it go to something else and trigger some control? Just the complexity, just layer upon layer upon layer. And so we actually took a step back and said, all right, let's hang our shingle. So we did. We opened Monit. Monit doesn't mean anything. It was a URL we could find. Um, our software later became iMonit. That wasn't available when we started, but it sounds good. And, and, um, and so we, we hung our, sh our, our shingle out and said, we're in business. And um, yeah, by far, the business transactions that Monet has seen have been substantially faster than any other transaction I've ever seen. Um, fast forward till today, we're getting between uh, 3,800 and 4,200 uh, new inquiries or, or uh, people coming into our store per day. Um, and the reason is because the messaging of what can be monitored is being heavily portrayed by, by Monet and more importantly by our uh, 
300 private label partners. <coughs> so, um, so Monit, as you can see, Monit provides wireless sensors that then transmit their data about the business or, or uh, environment to a gateway that receives <coughs> the data, then pushes it to a cloud-based application that then displays that so that, that people can monitor what's going on in their businesses. Okay? And we've got about uh, 7,800 customers, um, and things are, things are going really well. Um, why I believe Monit is in a position to talk about the Internet of Things and make some, some, if you will, predictions or strong statements about what's going on is because I feel that we're at the tip of the spear. And what I mean by that is those 4,000 customers that come into our storefront liter or virtually on our website, um, many of them have applications that you couldn't come up with in your wildest dreams. And more importantly, the transaction from them, um, from their need to being, getting that need addressed is, is extremely fast. Faster than any other technology I've seen in information technology. Specifically, last, this is just the past, uh, since Monday, um, we received a large order of sensors for the uh, Cheyenne, Wyoming landfill. All right. If I would have asked you, anybody here, is the middle of Wyoming landfill going to be an IoT prospect? I would have said no. Okay. Substantial order, monitoring gas, monitoring vehicle presence, monitoring uh, uh, facilities, monitoring heavy equipment, um, about 17 different types of wireless sensors, plus a handful of other control devices. Um, Tuesday, I got a call from the largest entomology bugs lab in the nation, where they are continually growing and monitoring bugs. Uh, one of the problems with bugs is they're, they're pretty temperate. They've got to have the right environment. And um, this group in Florida, they lost a massive amount of bugs last week, about $300,000 worth of bugs. So, substantial problem that needed to be addressed. And then one of the other ones that's kind of fun is uh, uh, the largest banana ripening um, company in the world where they bring, you know, bananas are very green when they get them, they bring them in for a certain amount of time, they ripen them in these massive warehouses, and then they ship them out. Uh, again, these are, these are things that we, as Monitor, are able to see and are excited, and, and as, personally as a technologist, I'm excited to see the breadth of, of these applications. So for us, what is the IoT marketplace? It's not the traditional consumer, commercial, and industrial. To us, it's different. It's people, places, and things. Now, you might think that's saying the same thing in a different way, but I don't think it is. Okay? Because of the breadth of these applications, here's an example. For people, it's not just a consumer, the consumer that has a cell phone. It might be as personalized as a wearable. This is a concept that we created a few years ago for a, a spoon that measures and gives you feedback on the amount of food you eat. Okay? Vibrates when you're eating too fast, shocks you if you eat too much. Okay? We never actually marketed or finished this up. There's a group at CES last year that had something very similar to this that actually got funded. But um, so it's about the people and what people are doing, not necessarily, hey, we're all we're all clones that use the same piece of technology. It's the Internet of Things is more personal than anything we've ever seen with technology. Right? It goes way beyond a wearable that tells me how many steps I take. Okay? So that's the people aspect of it. And then on the, th on the places side of it, it's not we are deploying technology into the office. Right? It's not in the office. It is the office. Okay? <laughs> the customer is the office. It's all things around the environment. Surprisingly, I could probably walk around here and tell you 10 different areas that could be applied. I can tell you when this garbage uh, can is full. You know, one of our customers at Maxstream was the largest supplier of synchronized clocks. Of course, there's all of the lights and there's, you know, it, it's, the places are, 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 are massively more than just a, a desk that gets a laptop on it or a PC tucked underneath it, okay? So the, the places is exponentially greater than we've ever seen. And then finally, it's the things. And this is where we, as Monitor, are really focused. Um, everything from vending machines to heating, uh, 
ventilation air conditioning systems. Um, one of my favorites is this, this blue one right here. One of the things we monitor are industrial heaters. Okay. Um, we have a problem here in the United States with bed bugs. One of the most surefire ways to take care of bed bugs is to take an industrial heater into the environment and heat it to 130 degrees for two hours, and it dries them out completely, 100% effective. Okay? Who would have, before they came here, thought bed, bed bug exterminators is a hot market for IoT? <laughs> okay? It is, um, from a revenue perspective, it's, it's, it's staggering. So, and the problem just keeps getting worse. So that's, you know, our, our perspective is, is that. So, um, from here I want to talk about three key observations and give you some more anecdotal um, uh, references to, to why we made those observations. First of all, um, the market is diverse and deep. If you, have, if you haven't caught that yet, that's, that's what I'm most passionate about, right? All of the examples. These are actual customer situations that we are selling product into, okay? It is much more broad and much more deep than you could ever imagine. Agricultural monitoring, apartment complex, art gallery, bank-owned property, bed bugs, boat bilge pump, boiler temperature, commercial plumbing, commercial property, commercial refrigeration, construction equipment, convenience stores, crawl space, data center, fleet management, food service, foreclosed property, frozen pipes, greenhouse inventory, canine units, life cycle monitoring for equipment, medical equipment, where they're at, how they're operating. Mortuary cooler monitoring, absolutely, it's a big one. Museum light exposure, organ and tissue, co tissue cooler monitoring, parking garages, pharmaceutical, production line, rental tool, residential, resort, server rooms, sump pumps, temperature, toilet, water, big, see that? A little vibration sensor on a, on a toilet can tell you Literally, if, the, if there's a leak going on, it can tell you how many people are living in the apartment by the number of flushes. Vacant property, warehouse monitoring, water heater, water leak, and wine storage. Okay? Scratching the surface here. Literally scratching the surface. So, my, my first observation that I think is critical is that it's, it's, it's broad and it's deep. Deeper and broader than you can ever imagine. Now, I'm not just a fan of the Hair Club of America, I'm a customer, right, as they say. Um, I personally have 84 sensors in my life. Okay, I've got my home, I've got teenage girls, so I definitely have monitoring systems, sensors on doors and windows and things like that. I have a farm, I have horses, I have equipment, and I have a business. And between all of that, about two years ago, I had one of those aha moments where I went to look, grab my phone, and it wasn't to check email, it wasn't to see you texted or called, it was right to my data to tell me how my sensors were doing in, in those key areas that I was concerned about. And I've been, a, I've been, I've been hooked on that data, I would say, um, more so than anything else. And what have I saved? I've saved, uh, a, water, uh, saved a flood in my basement because of a water heater. I, I had a horse that was very sick, a, a, a horse that um, is important to our family and very valuable to us that uh, had a problem we were able to monitor. Um, numerous batteries in equipment and things like that. I, I need to go through, I haven't done it, but the, the savings are going to be staggering. Um, another example is uh, we were contacted, uh, you know, diversity. We were contacted by a specialty product regional trucking company. This company is contracted by Amazon Fresh to take um, from a, one warehouse literally to another in one of the eight, or in the eight markets that Amazon sells groceries. Um, this trucking company came to us and said, uh, we've lost, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars worth of produce over the past six to eight months. We need a remote monitoring solution, and we need it tomorrow. So we we approached them and said, we've got wireless sensors, as you can see on the on the truck. We've got these cellular-based receiver or gateway that plugs in to the to the electro, uh, electrical system of the truck, and these sensors monitor the temperature and feed that sensor data back to a, a, a data cloud application where they're able to get alerts and alarms when something happens. The end result is the ROI, and here's the numbers. They typically check the temperature about every 10 minutes when they're on the road. Some, um, uh, is, well, that's what they're down to now. 
Um, the bottom line is they figured that they would save uh, about $104,000 in one year based upon a $109,000 cost that they had uh, for the staff to, to monitor these, these 10 trucks versus the $5,800 that it took to uh, uh, put sensors on all of these systems. Um, this is not uncommon. The ROI um, for the Internet of Things, that ratio is, is quite, in my opinion, staggered. Now, I think a lot of business people go, you're leaving $104,000 on the table, right? Um, and I think I have that conversation in my head more than I don't. But I'll, I'll come back to this. I don't think it's necessarily that. What I do believe is that value evolves. Okay? If we remember what happened in the IT industry, you know, WordPerfect, what did they sell initially? Right? A friend of mine was one of their first sales guys. They sold word processing programs to law firms. Okay? Then they got into Corel, or the drawing programs and the spreadsheets. And value, I believe, will incrementally grow as people become more and more comfortable with the Internet of Things. I have no concerns that I can sell a $5,800 solution to somebody at where they're saving $105,000. Um, I believe that we'll get, at the end of the day, with this customer in particular, we will get substantially more than that 109 because, and I'll talk more about this, of what happens with the information. There's a First, I'm becoming aware of the situation, but then there's even more beyond that. Um, okay, the second observation with the Internet of Things is that the infrastructure of today's information technology industry will not be the infrastructure of the Internet of Things. I hear a lot of people kind of argue that. Um, and, and, and frankly, if you follow any of the analysts right now, who are the leading IoT companies? Cisco, Intel, IBM, and I'm, I'm here to loudly proclaim that I disagree with that. You know, just like there has been always an evolution of, you know, again, Microsoft and Novell here, they were leaders. I Omega was a leader in these entities in Utah. And, you know, the Microsofts, you know, you, it's, now it's Google and Apple. There will be an evolution of of the infrastructure and the infrastructure of the Internet of Things will be substantially more intricate and uh, uh, dispersed than we've seen with any other phase of the information technology industry. Um, uh, I think the first challenge or question is going to be how much of the legacy infrastructure will carry over versus development of new infrastructure. Case in point, I think the most substantial question on the, on the table in my world, in the Internet of Things, is how does a piece of information go from my grandpa to me? Okay. Well, it's probably not going to be wired. Let's, let's throw that out. It's probably going to be wireless. Is it going to be Wi-Fi? Is it going to be Bluetooth? Is it going to be something else? Is it going to be cellular? My experience tells me that it's not going to be any of those. Why? Well, the same reason that I, I stream Netflix on Wi-Fi is the same reason I'm not going to use it in IoT when all I need is a bit of information, very small amounts of data. I, I really hate to drive a Mack truck to deliver a red wagon full of dirt. This doesn't make sense. And it doesn't make sense from a cost perspective, too. right? If I'm delivering a Mack truck to my customer, yeah, I might get more of the $105,000, but the next guy that comes around with a speedy little red wagon, he's going to get that business from me. So I think that, you know, going back, wireless and the, 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 the platform there, um, I'll, I'll take it one step further. If that data goes from my grandpa to a receiver, call it a gateway, Cisco's the leader in that, right? They're one of the most prominent. Um, their infrastructure is set up to take advantage of IP this, IP that, IP4, IP6. What, again, what kind of overhead is involved there? Um, another challenge that I think we've got is <coughs> batteries. You know, we hear a lot of people talking about, uh, you know, it, we take it for granted how many batteries we have, but as, as these Internet of Things get more complex, the battery technology we have today will not suffice, right? Lithium's a little too expensive. It's a little too volatile, right? Energy harvesting, I can get a AA battery 
in quantities for 16 cents. Okay? I can power one of our sensors with two AA batteries for nine years. Okay? That's a 32 cent without cost. Right? There's more I, I need to do on that with that sensor, like add audio and video, and that's going to use power. But ultimately, new tech versus old tech um, comes back to what's that infrastructure like? Um, you know, uh, additionally, we have to worry about is the pipe, as I said, is it, is it a cell phone pipe or is it satellite or is it some other thing? We have to assume that it's going to evolve. Just like we understand that GPS didn't exist a number of years ago, and now it's a, it's a standard. Okay? What other technologies maybe the government will bring to bear, or other research labs? Um, so that's, that's your pipes. I've mentioned power. Um, carriers are one that's kind of interesting. I, I think Sprint's here. They're a key partner of ours. Uh, we also have key partnerships with uh, Verizon, with AT&T, with Vodafone, Telefonica, and Rogers. Um, I love the carriers. But I don't think they get IoT per se. And they probably shouldn't, frankly. Right? They're, they're there for transferring significant amounts of data. They're there for phone calls. But um, the infrastructure, even the infrastructure of LTE, is not designed for the Internet of Things. Okay? They're going to make it fit. And, and it's going to be at a cost to the device and to a cost of the infrastructure. But, and, and they're the incumbent, because they have towers everywhere. Um, and again, they're a very important partner of ours, but it really is trying to fit, you know, a hand into a shoe. Not really made for that. So, um, the second thought on, on, the, uh, on the evolution is really whether to build or buy. Um, you know, Mono, we decided to build our own wireless infrastructure. We decided to build our own products. Um, at the very technical level, uh, the evolution of chips uh, is happening so fast. The ability to take a design and share a design, the ability to have a design built in matters of days um, for those things that are touching the things um, has never been faster. Right? We turn products, we can turn a product in 30 days, easily. Right? We can design a product, we can modify a sensor, we can give it power, we can create a housing and everything, 3D printers and everything like that. The time to market is so fast. So the question is build or buy. And I, I don't have the answer for that. We do some of each. But I think it will, let me take one step back. If there's so many things out there, again, I think that it's important to remember that, they, that each thing, even two things that appear to be the same, may need different pieces of technology to make it come onto the in online with the Internet of Things. Um, I'll go ahead on the side note here too. The, the most interesting observation I'd say that I've made with, within the past six months with our customers are this diverse set of things. I can't take the same device and always put it on there mechanically. One of our largest customers is a, uh, is a two and a half billion dollar um, manufacturer of high end office furniture, high end office chairs, fifteen hundred dollar chairs. Okay, this company has forty two patents around the use of chairs. They landed a contract with um, Exxon Mobil to be the supplier of furniture to five new billion dollar buildings, but but uh, Exxon said. Okay, you know, we want to use your furniture, but we don't want to own any of it. You need to bring it in, and you need to bill us monthly for the amount of shares that are used. So they partnered. They essentially take one of our little wireless sensors, use their patented technology. One of the sensors goes on the bottom of the chair, and as somebody sits down on it, moves it, shakes it, whatever, they start billing. Okay. But you would think that a simple sensor on the bottom of a chair could be any form factor. It could be any mechanical interface. They're on the fourth iteration, and I would argue that, that, again, it's amazing that they had to modify it. They had to go with a different battery. They had to go with a different clip. They had to go with a different color. They had to go with a different design. And, and so they're, they're selling tens of thousands of these chairs with a sensor on the bottom that reports 
at the end of the day how much that chair was used so that they could send a bill to ExxonMobil at the end of the month for butts in seats. Um, you know, a, a, this sample, this, this second observation about the infrastructure and how it changes, um, a, a quick one is, is a data closet, right? Um, you know, typically you think of a data closet as being very IT full. It's got the latest and greatest. Um, we found that this is one of the most fertile, fertile markets for technology today. If you go to Center 7, you go over the point of the mountain, our sensors are throughout their facility. We're in uh, hundreds of data centers and, and server rooms. Um, and it's to monitor rack temperatures, uh, water pressure or water presence, or differential air pressure as well as humidity, and and more recently power consumption. Um, we had a great example that came up a couple of weeks ago. A school district in Yano, Texas, uh, where they had water get into one of their server rooms, cost them a lot of money. They put a test unit in place. The following weekend, they got a call from our system letting them know that the AC um, unit was failing, uh, went over there and found that, that you know, the system had saved them a lot of money just by letting them know. Um, the third observation is the go-to-market, or how, how, does, how does the market, and this again as a sales guy, this is probably an area that I think about more than anything, and some of the challenges, how does this become the you know, trillion dollar business that it's going to become? Um, I think there's some, some inherent complexities to the Internet of Things. One of the first ones is that there are certifications and standards. Uh, Monash out of Murray, Utah, um, we, we have had no trips outside of the U.S. We go to a few trade shows, we do a lot of web marketing, but 27% of our customers, 27% of, of our revenue comes from international. So, you know, what are the assumptions we can, we can take from that? A, the speed of information through the internet is always what it is, and it's going to only be getting faster. B, the demand is substantially higher than I would have guessed, right? I mean, we're getting, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars of orders <coughs> blindly from overseas. Um, but then C, that demand is, is allowing those customers to plow through what I would say is a legacy of bureaucracy. Okay? Again, if we're talking about a new market, something that's, that's not just an extension onto IT, the legacy of standards and certifications, I would argue, are not necessarily going to apply. Okay? So, is it, again, it kind of ties back to the Wi-Fi. Is it uh, some things that are UL rated or not UL rated? Um, you know, I, I have a problem with standards that legacy companies uh, come up with because I don't think they have I, I don't think they have the perspective. But that's one of the, the biggest challenges of going to market is understanding what those complexities are. I don't have the answer, and we see it every day. And our, our biggest customers overseas are tackling it themselves at their expense. We spend as much on certifications um, within our company as anything else. Right now, we've got 19 products in certification in Singapore and seven in certification here in the U.S. And it's been that way for a couple of years. Uh, um, I don't know any way to get around it. Um, it's, it's, it's trying to standardize to something that's evolved. Um, second, as I mentioned, it's, it's the globalization of the Internet of Things. Um, you know, we're, one of our biggest customers is the largest uh, owner of uh, real estate in uh, Asia Pacific. They're owned out of Hong Kong, and none of their product is sold here in the U.S. They're just about to finalize a partnership with IBM and, and try to come into this market, but everything we've supplied them has been based around their global markets, uh, EMEA, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, and Asia Pacific. So 430, or 868 megahertz and 900 megahertz wireless sensors. Had we not designed our product with an understanding that we were going to be global, we would have to create a new product for each one. For us, we have one product that is one, if you will, skew that applies to everything. Now, frankly, we didn't do that on purpose. 
<laughs> but, but we're benefiting from it in that we're able to keep our costs low. Put it in perspective, one of our little sensors costs $50. Okay? And so for us to keep the price low, um, there has to be some economies of scale that you try to bring into bear as you attack the global markets. Um, the third one, and I'd call this the, 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 the moose on the table, is security. Um, I probably have more discussions around security as a component of technology than anything else. And I am just schizophrenic. It's, yes, it is needed. No, it's not. Yes, just, and you know what? I, I think over the past few months, it's come to, to a head. And specifically, that I think I've got, let me see here. Security is a tug of war, right? With the current infrastructure for information technology security, it is inherently um, cumbersome to a wireless transmission and wireless upload. Okay? Right now, if I'm sending a sensor reading, it's a very small amount of data. But if I add security and some of the back and forth that has to take place for security, it may be as many as 18, 19, 20 times the trip wirelessly to get that information. We take it for granted because we have real fat pipes with these. But if you have something that's battery powered that's out on a pipeline or something like that, that has to go 20 times to get one piece of information, you can read into that. The system has to be much more expensive. And so depending on the application, depending on the market for the Internet of Things, security has a, 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 a bearing. Another very large customer of ours, 150 or 165,000 locations. Okay, very large company. They have uh, they have systems within these facilities that are very temperamental. Um, they are in the telecommunications world. They're very savvy about security. We, we we went out, presented our solution. They tried it, and we said, okay, well, we're not really set up for security. So here's our options. We're going to deploy this and this and this, and the sensor needs to be a little bigger, and the battery has to be a little bigger. And they said, no, no, this is a price point. We want that one without security. And that floored us. Why would, why would this massive telecommunications company be okay without it? Because the data that's being transmit, transmitted is what's the temperature in that room or on that piece of equipment at this time. They don't care. They don't care if Al-Qaeda gets it. It has no bearing to it, right? On the other side of that, especially as you get into control, security is everything. Because imagine that they had a sump pump in there that starts filling up, and then they had to send a, a signal back, right? And that signal was uh, to turn that sump pump on, but that signal was intercepted and not received through nefarious means. That would be a problem and cause massive, massive problems. So, you know, I think one of the biggest issues is security and how it plays out. It's not a given. And, and frankly, it's, it's kind of a dichotomy that, that, that's going to different directions. Um, then, you know, probably the, the most important thing of all of this thing, and I think it's a given, is that data drives decisions, right? Every one of our customers, um, we have an extremely high success rate with our technology staying in place. And I bring that up because um, this first wave of wireless sensors in this deployment, all people are looking to do is to become aware, okay? To get alerted to, ah, the temperature in my data closet is too hot, right? Oh, I'm gonna go take care of it. The aware state, if you will, is adequate for an ROI perspective at this level. Call it layer one, okay? Um, and again, that $5,800 for $109 offset, or $109,000 offset, that's enough. They're seeing that. Um, but just like we saw with the first PC that was under a, a desktop when somebody was using their word processor, it evolves, right? And we believe we're seeing the evolution to the next state is from aware to predictive, okay? Specifically to that customer that I was talking about that has 160,000, 65,000 locations, they're happy with the data of what the temperature is, but now they're saying, okay, put this current transducer that measures current on an air conditioning unit, and if it starts drawing more than 20 or 30 amps, that thing is about to go bad. So at 40 or 50, we're going to go ahead and roll a truck out to take a look at that. Predictive maintenance, okay?
which is substantially more than wait till it fails and then fix it, which is the aware state. It's the predictive aware, or excuse me, pr predictive uh, uh, abilities within an IoT system. And then the third one, and I'll, and I'll use the same example, it's the transformative. So with this customer, what they're specifically doing is they're taking, they're taking the temperature in that little building, they're taking the current draw from an air conditioning unit, and then they're saying, okay, it's getting close, we need to send a truck out there. Out of our 4,500 uh, independent contractors that are out there that work for us, which one is closest? Which one has a truck that's full of gas? Which one has an employee that we can pay less than $14 an hour? and do it on a day when there's no traffic, no bad weather, and um, you know, my end cost is a third of what it would be as if it was, was uh, an emergency. That's taking place, I'd say, with our most sophisticated companies or partners, and that, I believe, is transformative. So from aware to predictive to transformative, and, and, and I'd close with that. But I believe this Internet of Things is substantially more transformative than we've seen any uh, the IT industry in whole, or any any section thereof. Now that's a bold statement, and and uh, uh, you know there's no way to predict that effectively. But the reason I can say that is because the customers that are getting into this are customers that have never been in technology per se or Internet of Things. I got a call last week from a Botox clinic chain in Minneapolis. Okay, they they called me and said we just lost twenty-two thousand dollars worth of Botox because it wasn't frozen; it was supposed to be refrigerated. And I, you know, whatever. I was talking to somebody that, that had a PC. That's all they'd ever experienced. They had a cell phone, and in fifteen minutes, we were able to, to close a sale for ten thousand dollars and send a product. Yeah. That is a Botox clinic that has one mission, and that's putting Botox in people. Okay? For them to move beyond cell phones, and PCs, and printers, which is the breadth of their technology, to monitoring systems throughout all of their coolers and fridges, I think that's, that's the engine that's going to drive all of this. And it's, again, it's, it's blue ocean, as they say. So new markets and new opportunities. So in closing, um, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, you, you, you star. Um, I, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about this, and, and I would hope that, that you would go here with the message or with the thought that um, uh, Monet is a company that's looking to collaborate. Um, I, as a serial entrepreneur that, that believes in, in our culture and our community here, I'm willing to help and, and excited to do so if there's anything I can do. And I encourage you, if you're in the business of IT, to expand your vision, expand your thought. As they say, seize the day. This is, this is incredible. And, and that's just our opinion from seeing so many unique applications come in the door. Um, I believe that the opportunities are deeper into the opportunities. Um, you know, we chose a broad play. But those vertical plays are going to pan out substantially more than any other vertical play, I believe, that, that you've seen um, uh, in IT as well. So with that, I appreciate your time and, and happy to answer any quick questions. If anybody has them. Thank you. Any questions? We'll take one or two. Or zero. Or zero. Oh, here we go. Here's a couple. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to ask what your vision of the Internet of Things is in terms of your perspective, your background, your expertise. What is your vision of what you see it becoming in the future? You know, I'm, I'm a technologist first and foremost, so I, I embrace technology, but I, I'm, I'm one of those that also fears it a little bit, because at my dinner table I have, you know, teenagers that don't even look me in the eye, and so I do fear that we will be, you know, so, so inundated, yet the efficiencies of, of the things we worry about, the things we care about, it's going to touch all of those things. People, places, things, and, and those things that matter most. And there's a linear correlation to how much we're willing to spend for those things, right? I wouldn't put a $10,000 sensor on a $3,000 horse, right? But there's a threshold there. So all of that needs to be worked out. But it's, it, it is impacting every aspect of our life. Yeah, one more? Yeah. Uh, 
What's your opinion on mesh networking? Great, great question. Appreciate that. And, and any other technical questions I can talk about. Uh, my last company, MaxStream, had some of the best mesh technology on the planet at the time. There's a lot of mesh plays out there now. The, the only issue with mesh is that typically it requires one of two things. More sophisticated clocks or timing or crystals, which increases the cost of your design. Or you've got to have batteries and things on all the time. So for me to mesh with you, you have to have your ears on all the time, right? And that's, that's or know when to turn your ears on. With RF, the challenge with those synchronized timings are that something might get in the way and block my message, and then your clock gets drifted from my clock, and that hasn't been completely worked out. But I love mesh. I'm an advocate of it. I just, it's, it's not fully fed. So. Thank you. All right. Thanks again, Brad. Appreciate it.